So hi, welcome everybody. Welcome to a new episode of What the F is Going On in Latin America and the Caribbean every Wednesday at noon. Uh, today we have with us uh, Carlos Ron, who is the Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs for North America of Venezuela. And uh, I thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, so, My pleasure. So we, uh, we want to talk a little bit about what is going on in Venezuela right now. Uh, but before going into uh, all this uh, Iran-Venezuela relation and the tanks coming on that we have seen in the news uh, lately, I wanted to talk a little bit about what is going on here in the United States. So uh, all this social explosion that we have seen that took the whole world by surprise because we didn't know that something like this was going to happen right now. Um, we can try to see a little bit of a uh, resemblance of what happened in Venezuela in 2014 and 2017 with the Guarimbas. Uh, the only, the big difference is that uh, in the contrary of what's happening here, what the Guarimberos did in Venezuela, uh, with a lot of violence, was asked for the head of Nicolas Maduro. So they were they want they're ask, asking for a regime change. The country of uh, United States right now, where uh, protesters are just demanding for social justice. But all the political class in the U.S. Uh, st stood with, in solidarity with the Guarimberos. Uh, but when people here in the U.S. are demanding for social justice. Uh, you can see uh, Trump asking the military to come and, and repress this uh, peaceful pro protest. protest. Uh, so can you talk a little bit about this? What's your impression, uh, having seen what happened in Venezuela and here? Well, I think that, um, you know, uh, to start with, um, the issue at play is that you have um, a group of people that have been excluded for a long time in the United States. Uh, they have been excluded for uh, reasons of race, reasons of the economy, and really they're, you know, somehow they're expressing their frustration against privilege. What happened in Venezuela in 2014, 17, and, and all these protests that, that you mentioned is the opposite. Is the privileged class for the first time feeling that they've lost those privileges and, and somehow trying to aggressively go out on the streets and, and, and regain them uh, from a popular government. So you have, so you have a, 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 an opposition um, that you know, is really asking uh, for enfranchisement or asking to be included or to participate, but rather was asking to maintain privileges and to maintain a certain part of the population excluded. And one key factor uh, and where you see race, for example, uh, at play, is that in the, you know, even uh, exactly three years ago, we're, you know, and in, 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 um, just a few, couple of days ago, we, we commemorated uh, three years of the death of uh, um, Orlando Figueres, which is uh, one of the ones, uh, you know, one of the, the, the that's uh, most impacted Venezuela, because this was an Afro-Venezuelan who was on his way to work, uh, you know, and, and he passed by one of these opposition uh, concentrations and, 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 and the people saw him and they said, you know, hey, you know, this guy, he, because of his skin color, because of the clothes he's wearing, he must be Chavista, he's infiltrated, and the mob just went after him and, you know, beat him up. They stabbed him several times and then, you know, threw gasoline on his body and lit him on fire. And this was one of the hate crimes, you know, most memorable hate crimes. It wasn't the only one. I mean, it was, there was over 20 of these, in, these cases, but this is one we remember um, because we, you know, we, we, uh, we saw uh, a lot of pictures, there were videos and, and, and so forth. So, so this same racism that somehow wants to, you know, keep, uh, a group of people excluded in the United States. You could see it uh, um, in, in Venezuela in, 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 in those years. And now what, what I think you see, uh, you know, also is that, that the same policy, in a way, of exclusion, of putting people down, of, of, of somehow trying to control 
uh, people and, and cause suffering to, to the other. Uh, this is something that you see uh, translated into foreign policy in the United States. So the same way you press people down and you press them uh, in the United States with a police state, now you also have it. Now, now you also have it in the foreign policy through sanctions. You know, through these unilateral coercive measures that the United States uses, that are they are illegal, and they're trying. And, you know, they're they're trying to keep uh, the Venezuelan or create the most possible suffering onto the Venezuelan people, so that they produce the regime change that uh, that Washington is interested in. So this is more or less what is happening with gasoline, right? Because uh, we know that uh, gasoline is a very uh, sensitive subject in Venezuela, issue in Venezuela, right? Um, so what do you think is the strategy here uh, of the U.S.? Uh, what is the U.S. trying to do uh, to Venezuela? Well, see, in the same way, so, so, so we talk, we usually talk about, when we talk about sanctions, we talk about the, you know, things that are most obvious and, and they're most uh, important from a humanitarian standpoint. People immediately talk about food and talk about medicine, which are, you know, obviously priorities. Now, what we don't talk about so much is about other types of measures that also affect, uh, seriously affect um, um, the you know people's lives and for example one of the targets and one of the main targets in, in recent times of, of the US measures has precisely been uh, um, you know gasoline because with when you target gasoline it's then you stop you know that, that means you 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 put brakes on food distribution you put, put brakes on the distribution of medicine and you and you generate this the sense of, of uh, you know um, I don't know despair between the pop, you know, among the population, because you got to think, you know, you you you're you're forcing people to be on the streets, uh, waiting for gasoline lines, and pe some people have to, you know, to to need to have their their, their gasoline, their cars because they, they need to go to the doctor's treatment. I mean, I have a relative, for example, uh, you know, that that he he uh, he's my uncle. He he goes uh, under dialysis treatment. And he has to every you know every two days he needs to you know go to the, to the hospital and get that. That's not something you can do at home. That's something you need to do at a, a specialized place, and you need transportation for that. So imagine what happens to people when you, you you start blocking that. And this is purposely done by the United States because they know of you know they they they've been doing this for a long time. Uh, they've been they've been envisioning how to block uh, gasoline in Venezuela. Uh, first, they did it by taking over Citgo. Or when Citgo, our car, our, our, the, the way uh, the, the oil business was distributed in Venezuela, we produced the, the crude oil here, and it was refined in the refineries in, in the United States in Citgo, and then it came back as gasoline. Or, we, you know, there's some uh, refineries here in Venezuela would also process gasoline in a, in a lower uh, amount. But they usually imported uh, some components which go into the mix because it was, you know, it's cheaper to do that and, 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 and then, uh, you know, sell off the, the crude. It's just the way that the business was set up. When you take over Citgo and you take that away from, uh, from, uh, from the equation, then you're, you're blocking the entrance of gasoline. And then they started blocking all the companies, all the, you know, all the ships and tankers, you know, everybody that somehow was responsible for bringing the components to Venezuela so that you could process gasoline. So in the meantime, you also accompany this with this, with this uh, 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 campaign telling people, you see, this is the problem of the socialist government because the socialist government, how, how is it that an oil producing company, uh, uh, country doesn't have gasoline? And it's basically because of this blockade. So that's why we went into this arrangement with, with Iran. And you know we've we've had a relationship with Iran uh, for many years. This isn't a new relationship. This isn't something that because because now you know you, you see some people uh, trying to make up uh, uh, fantasy stories in in their heads and and, and you know and trying to say oh this is Iran trying to get now into Latin America and you know like like the boogeyman story. But we've had a relationship with Iran since the founding of OPEC. And we've gotten closer in, in you know in the last couple of years because there's 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 a, a integration a cooperation and because precisely where the country is trying to overcome defy these uh, measures from the United States 
What we did was a simple purchase, purchase gasoline and components so that we could get our, our refining started here. And all of a sudden, you know, the, uh, uh, the media is, uh, and, you know, the State Department is trying to blow this up as if this was something that was illegal. And, but, you know, yeah. Venezuela has a right, like any country, to, to trade. I was, was going to ask about that because, uh, well, also I wanted to say that they're also threatening to, to sanction the captains of those ships and the people that work on those ships. That would is just crazy. But anyway, so I just wanted to talk about the way that this gasoline was purchased. So they're trying to criminalize, well, the US is trying to criminalize the fact that uh, the Venezuela is buying this gasoline with gold. So what is your uh, opinion about this? And can you, since we're going to talk about the gold, can you talk a little bit about um, the gold that is uh, in right now in, in England? Well, two things. First of all, you know, the, 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 the payment, you know, we, we paid, we made this purchase in, 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 in currency, in dollars. This wasn't uh, made a purchase in, in gold. What the United States uh, uh, spokespersons are trying to do, though, is, uh, you know, create this idea that Venezuela is somehow conducting illegal activities in order to, uh, you know, purchase these, uh, you know, purchase gasoline or whatever they were doing. Because they need to sell the narrative that Venezuela is an outlaw state and that anything that Venezuela does, you know, is, 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 is illegal, it's on the law. It's not, it's just, it just didn't happen. You know, that's not, we, we made a financial transaction like any other country would have made a, a, a transaction. It wasn't gold. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't that, uh, uh, that, uh, uh, um, uh, that type of transaction. Uh, but they're, they're trying to create these rumors, you know, and, and, and so that, it was so that, gold. It was, if, if it was really uh, paid with gold, is there a problem with that? I mean, you have the right as a country to to do a transaction. Well, that's a, that's that's a very valid question too. I mean, again, we're a country making a purchase for another country has is is not illegal. I mean, we have a right. I mean, and and, and you know, it, it, coming from the United States, the country of free trade, and you know, and and all this promotion is actually a. a, a an attack on the principle of free trade. Now you mentioned gold, and and you know what uh, uh, we 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 have you know as part of the blockade, because you know it's not only the, the U.S. financial system that has blocked us, but also you know we've been blocked by by uh, some European countries. And for example, some of the gold we have, some of our reserves that were uh, under custody of the Bank of England. Well, now they this they the bank you know we, what we try to do was say look. We know you blocked this illegally. However, in the middle of this pandemic, you know, we need to we need to use all the resources we have so that we can uh, provide for our people. So, in order to avoid all this, I, we know you're doing this illegally, but in order to avoid all this mess, we are just asking that you transfer the money to accounts belonging to the United Nations uh, Development Program. UNDP, and they would do the purchases necessary for uh, medical equipment and, and, you know, all these supplies that we need to, uh, you know, to, to cope with COVID-19. We're not, you know, it wasn't going to go to a Venezuelan government account. It wasn't going to be handled by anyway. It was going to go directly to uh, UNDP. UNDP knows what our requirements are, and then, you know, have them, they denied. They, you know, they, 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 they started uh, this, uh, um, uh, you know, they, they, they said that they couldn't do it because they didn't know, again, you know, questioning who the, whose authority it is. So now this is going on to trial to see, uh, uh, you know, because we are suing the Bank of England to see, if, you know, if we could get our, our, our gold back. But again, it's, it's the same principle that, you know, you, there, there's no regard, there's no concern for the life of people. And this is why the, the, the sanctions and, 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 and this whole policy is criminal because there's no way, you know, the people say, oh, but the, the, there are exceptions. No, there are no exceptions. Because whatever, even if you try to buy things that are supposedly exempted, you have, you know, all, you have all this blockage from the, you know, the, the financial system. Not only the U.S., you can see it, you know, it works in the, in, the, in the British financial system, anything that's connected to U.S. financial system. So these are criminal actions because they punish a whole population 
in order to promote you know this destabilization and to promote a change of government and that's you know that's something we reject that's what we call you know uh we denounce it before the international community and that's why we are taking the u.s to the international criminal court as because these actions are for us a crime against humanity yeah so you you were talking about how this uh sanctions or actually you were saying that uh U.S. foreign policy is strangling uh, the Venezuelans with the sanctions that it's imposing. So can you talk, I know you have already maybe talked about this a lot, but can you explain uh, to maybe new uh, viewers of our show, how is exactly, how is this uh, affecting uh, in, with the coronavirus? How is this affecting Venezuelans? Well, like I said, the, the, the perverse system of, of sanctions is precisely, uh, you know, comes in a way that if, if you have, um, you know, uh, um, first of all, you need, you need to find who, uh, per, who, who is willing to sell you what you need. Because a lot of companies are scared to provide supplies to Venezuela because they believe they're going to be, you know, somehow uh, there's going to be repercussions. As a matter of fact, just so you get an idea, a couple of days ago, uh, there's there's a, a Mexican company uh, um, which issued a statement uh, saying that, you know, they, they, um, they were basically taken to bankruptcy. The arrangement we had with this, with this uh, uh, Mexican po company was that we provided we provided um, oil in exchange for food and some medical supplies. The sanctions and the and you know and the, the, the other measures that you know went against this company. Again, there was no exchange of money. It was you know basically oil for food, oil for medicine, and there was pressure put on this company. So much pressure that it took it to bankruptcy, and they filed and they and they and they came out with the statement saying you know, that they were no longer going to be able to uh, provide what they were providing for Venezuela. So, you know, this is a persecution of anybody that's doing business. Huh? Which was food, not, I mean, not arms or, you know, not, was food. Food and medicine. Food and medicine. That's, that's, uh, that's, that's what it was. So again, so, 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 so you see, so when you find a company like that one, who's willing to, to, to sell, then, you know, it, it gets hit with sanctions. When you find a company that is, uh, you know, it, 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 and then if you find a company, then you have the problems of how you pay because, you know, the, the banking system is, is blocked. You don't see, uh, you know, the, the resources are, 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 in the, are frozen in accounts or they delay too much. And, and then things end up costing three or four times the cost that they would do, you know, uh, that they would otherwise do it. And, you know, we've asked, we've asked the United States to, you know, to, to use the money that's frozen those, in those accounts to buy these items. You know, we asked them, we gave, we gave them the purchase order. We gave them what, you know, look, this is what we need. You know, take, you know, if you say that there's no problem with us buying food and medicine, this is what we need. These are the accounts that you have. Do the transfer yourself. If you want, you know, tell us what company you want us to buy from and we'll do it. And what's the answer? Oh, well, we can't do this because, uh, and then they start, you know, they, they, they start with that story that, you know, Maduro was not the president, but they recognize why though, and they go this, you know, myth. And all they do, and then let me tell you, all these people are doing is basically sustaining a bunch of crooks. You know, when they took over Sitgo, Sitgo had a foundation that a lot of our, our, our people, our viewers in, in, uh, in the United States know because the Simon Bolivar Foundation is the foundation that used to help out a lot of uh, social projects and you know the community projects in the Bronx and, and in, in, uh, in uh, Washington DC, uh, uh, Casa de Maryland, which is, uh, you know, for example, uh, at one point was, was, was a project that they helped because, uh, you know, that, that deals with uh, migrants. Um, Okay, so, so the foundation now is lost. I like the company's lost. So all those programs were lost. And all of a sudden, you know, a couple of weeks ago, they say, they published uh, something saying, you know, oh, we're, we're now, we have five NGOs where we're going to start providing help and, and money for Venezuela. Well, surprise, surprise. The first NGO on the list is one called Venezuelan Engagement uh, 
uh, foundation group. And who's listed, at, at, you know, who's listed as the board members? You know, the guy who's supposed to be the, you know, the fake ambassador of Guaido in Canada. I mean, how corrupt can you be? And how corrupt can the United States government be to promote this and to, you know, and to support this guy? And to support this, you know, this theft of Venezuelan, of, of you know, of the Venezuelan people. That is what it, that's what they're doing. The same way they abuse, the, you know, they, they abuse people in the United States, and, you know, they abuse African American communities, they abuse Latino communities. It's the same way they're trying to abuse the Venezuelan as a nation. And what they want, what they're after is them dismantling the whole, uh, you know, Venezuelan Republic and and establishing a new a neo-colonial project in Venezuela where they could take back all the resources and, and you know, give it to U.S. corporations. Uh, Carlos, I wanted to ask another question. It's about uh, about the gasoline situation in Venezuela. So we've heard some uh, people criticizing the fact that uh, Venezuela is privatizing the oil industry and uh, the sale of gasoline uh, in Venezuela. Can you give us a little bit more context? Well, there's not, it's not really a privatization in the sense that there's the, I mean, the, there is going to uh, still be a public, um, um, you know, uh, a public sale of, or, or by, by the state company, I should say, of gasoline. What, what we're doing is where we're adding another a group of, of uh, providers that are going to be, you know, from, from the private sector. Again, I, I think we have to see this as um, as part of the you know measures that have to be taken because of the uh, blockade and because of the uh, you know the, the sanctions of the U.S. I mean, you've seen all how you know the gasoline uh, production and it's been persecuted by the U.S. by you know cutting off uh, the, you know the, the necessary. Uh, components for for gasoline refinement. So, the and and also by cutting off the ships. And you know, even today, you know, uh, four ships were were uh, that that were have been working in the oil industry in Venezuela were sanctioned. And there's you know more than 50 other ships that have been sanctioned as well. So so this is part of a war against us. And we found that you know this is this uh, the president found that this is a, 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 a another aspect that that could help. Uh, you know, having private uh enterprise bring uh the gasoline over to venezuela and 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 be part of the suppliers i don't think it, we we gotta see it as uh a privatization of such privatization uh, the way you know uh the policies that, that that took place in in latin america and even venezuela in the 1990s and 1980s you know the was the complete loss of uh, the public sector, the you know the complete handover handover of uh, of these um, of these strategic resources, and that's not what's going on here. We're we're you know expanding a sector, and and that's all you know we're doing. Again, the 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 purposes within the context that we have of aggressions. How can we provide more options and and more possibilities for advance on people? And are the these uh, companies uh, could be subject to sanctions, the U.S. sanctions, these private companies? Well, I, I, you know, I can't say. Uh, it's up to Treasury to decide what you know what how they they uh, they deal with them and so forth. Um, what we've seen is that you know pretty much everybody is is open to these legal illegal measures from the U.S. So I wouldn't be surprised that they they try to sabotage. I mean, they already did today with, with those sanctions. I mean, they're they're trying to sabotage uh, the oil business in general because you know they they know that this is if you sabotage anything that has to do with oil production, oil exports, you're cutting off you know Venezuela's main uh, uh, lifeline, you know, as the main source of income. And it's what provides for, you know, what, what later pays for food and medicine and all the other things. So, you know, it's it, it's a key sector of the national economy that they need to to knock down so that uh, they could create that that suffering that you know that um, that they they mentioned. I mean, the, yeah, as far back as a couple of years ago, you know, you had a, a you know the former ambassador William Brownfield 
uh, described how you know he, there, was, there was a need to attack the oil sector so you could really prolong the suffering in Venezuela and then, and then uh, that would bring you the regime change that they wanted. So it's part of the tactic, you know, it's part of the strategy. Uh, so we, we've seen a lot of the strategy that comes from the State Department and from, you know, the U.S. government fail in multiple ways and times. And uh, we know that we have a president that don't like to lose. Can, should be we uh, aware, should be we uh, preoccupied about uh, what's going to happen in these uh, next month before U.S. presidential elections? What is your uh, perspective there? Well, well we, we're, in, we're in a difficult position for the following reasons. If, if uh, this is our, my belief, if, if you see that, um, if you see the way things are going down in the United States, where you have now, you know, massive riots in different countries, in different cities around the country. At the same time, you have, you know, you've, you've, you've reached over 100,000 uh, of deaths due to COVID-19 and no real signs that, you know, the, that the curve is actually, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, coming down, but, but, you know, the, you could actually have serious uh, concerns that it might spread more than it already is. And then you have other, you know, the, the economic problems that have, that are stemming out of the, you know, uh, mishandling of, of the COVID-19 crisis. You know, you, you reach 40 million people unemployed that weren't before the crisis. Um, then you see that Trump needs enemies and needs distraction so that he could guarantee or that he could find a way to rally his supporters in, in um, you know, in, in, in November. So one of the things is, is, is probably what, what's going on now with the protests, you know, presenting yourself as the law and order uh, president and, and, you know, trying to uh, uh, give this image that, you know, everybody, all these people are, are outlaws instead of, you know, recognizing that these people have really, you know, a, a claim to justice and, and that's, that's what's going on. So, but, but you know, you, you build on this confrontation, so he's trying to rally up his, his base or trying to rally up those that, you know, that, that somehow uh, want to see, you know, uh, order reestablished by force kind of thing. That's at home. But then at the international level, you see him, you know, spiking uh, disputes, you know, this whole confrontation as with China, which is ridiculous, you know. But, but it's increasing every day, you know, and, and, you know, and first, you know, you take it out on the, on the World Health Organization and you say, oh, the World Health Organization is helping out China, so we're going to, you know, take away the funding. And then you, and now, you know, getting into China's internal affairs by, you know, uh, getting into issues related with Hong Kong and, 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 and other uh, aspects. So you, you see how, you know, it's the shaping of the external uh, foe kind of thing uh, uh, before the elections. And, and you have China on, on, on the big front, on a big playing field, but then you also have other countries like Iran and Venezuela there too. And I th so that's what I think. I think it's something that we, we have to be attention be concerned because you, you never know what actions, what irrational actions uh, the White House is willing to take in order to, uh, you know, uh, uh, create a, a rally of support or, you know, show the... An image that you know he's getting uh, he's getting things done or he's doing something uh, because this this rhetoric against Venezuela that you know we're trying to flood the United States with cocaine and that's why we're a threat. Come on, I mean this is not even serious. But 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 it, but it's the kind of thing you use to rally support and become you know the national hero because oh you're protecting Venezuela you know or you're protecting the United States from 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 Venezuelan cocaine. I mean, come on, you know. We have to be we have to be careful, and I think we, we have to keep our eyes open, and so do you, in the United States, because you're the taxpayers and you're the people that are going to put the lives up if, if there's a, you know, if there's a a a, a, a war. Uh, I think you know we we have to uh, we all have to be careful and 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 observe the situation and call it for what it is. Call it for what it is. It's a distraction against, you know, from, from the problems and legal aggression. And it's, a, it's an attempt to, you know, take hold of Venezuela and resources. It's all these things combined. So I think we, we have to keep our eyes out and we have to keep denouncing all these attempts to, you know, against uh, Venezuelan uh, stability because 
they're being used as you know election props talking about elections there was a moment when we thought that when bernie sanders was in the race for the Demo democratic uh nomination we thought that all this uh policy aggressive policy towards venezuela was part of this electoral strategy uh to get rid of uh of Bernie Sanders, uh, like this new macartism uh, towards, uh, you know, this candidate. So we thought that maybe that was driving the, you know, the, the, the like making Venezuela uh, a domestic uh, electoral campaign. But uh, since he's out of the race right now, uh, can you see a difference in the, in the I don't know, the U.S. Uh, policy towards Venezuela? Is this something that you have noticed any difference or what's going on there? Well, I think, yeah, I, I agree on that. And for one, for part of the time, uh, you know, the, there was a, the use of Venezuela um, as a anti-socialist, uh, well, part of the anti-socialist rhetoric saying, you know, uh, yeah, Venezuela is, uh, uh, you know, uh, shows a failure of socialism and you needed to do that in order to um, play it off against Bernie Sanders. I don't think that's really gone away. I think, you know, I think um, uh, somehow it remains in the, in the discourse, in the official discourse, anything that's anti-left, anti-socialism, anti-progressivism, you know, it is, is still there. Um, you know, as a matter of fact, you can see just just now. You know, the the idea of of President Trump trying to um, uh, call or classify Antifa as a as a terrorist organization shows that you know, because I, at the end of the day, you know, it's, it's anti-fascism, and it's not really an organization as such, as as far as I'm concerned, but actually, a, you know, a movement or a set of ideas. Uh, and, 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 it's, and it's ideas against fascism. And a lot of the people that, you know, support him, uh, you know, identify with some of the ideas of fascism, which is something very dangerous and, 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 uh, and it's out there. And I think, you know, uh, he used that uh, to, to um, you know, he, he, he uses anti-left rhetoric uh, whenever he needs to, to create a, an, an enemy. And the enemy can be, you know, uh, uh, in general terms, it could be a terrorist, it could be a um, uh, drug trafficker, like, you know, like, like uh, in the case of Maduro, it could be somebody on the left, you know, the, like, the, the way, the way the, this administration has used these, um, these uh, labels is, is, is to create enemies, to create enemies that would pose them as the law and the uh, you know, law and order and the savior and you know the, the righteousness and then and the ones that def the defend uh, U.S. values, traditional values against this strange other people, and in the strange other people and this criminal other people, you know they throw everybody in the same sack, and they throw you know they like they throw the protesters and they throw uh, uh, President Maduro. I mean, it's just it's, it's the idea of creating an enemy. Uh, what, you know, what, that is exactly that's what they need now. So I think I think he's gonna he needs to create an enemy. Um, now you know you see you see he's doing it uh, in, in you know when you have a, a um, you have a, an internal situation where you have uh, you know the, the the greatest humanitarian crisis in the story, in, in, in the last hundred years with you know over a hundred thousand deaths from COVID nineteen. You have over forty million people unemployed. You have uh, you know all, the, all these all these problems uh, that he's facing. Uh, he needs to put point, you know pin to an external enemy. So you see the way he's been you know launching his attacks against China now, for example. You know now that he you know before he was almost near a trade agreement. Now that that's not even, that's out of the question. And all of a sudden you know you blame China for the for the pandemic and then you get out of the World Health Organization and you know all this attack against China and now the Chinese Communist Party you know so they bring back that communism monster again you know, the Chinese Communist Party this and the Chinese Communist Party this, and now all of a sudden you know they're, they're getting into China's internal affairs by you know messing with with, uh, 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 with with the issues going on in Hong Kong 
and and you know he so he finds outside enemies in China and but also in you know in Iran that like he did at the beginning of the year. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't that long ago when you know the the, the attack against uh, General Soleimani and and you know the things that happened against Iran, and now he's doing against Venezuela, you know uh, 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 as well. You know, so so I think. And and the thing is that Venezuela is, is is something that that gets him votes in Florida, and when he has when you know when you reach a point that because of the pandemic you have people over sixty five percent not agreeing with the way uh, well, Trump has handled it, and and you know uh, the party from his support base that he's trying to find other ways to rally up support, and he thinks that with you know uh, the, the stronger he gets against Venezuela, the more support he's going to get from the you know anti Cuban anti Venezuelan uh, political base he has. So I think, you know, I, I think that the, the, the Venezuela is still going to be part of the race. I think they still going to be part of that uh, rhetoric, you know, the anti-Trump uh, rhetoric uh, that he's going to use is, is that external enemy that's always there, you know, and so, and he has many faces. It could either be the face of a terrorist or the face of a drug trafficker or the face of a communist. It's, it's that boogeyman just to scare people into voting for Trump. And that's, you know, that's the whole point of it. Do you think this, because at first, uh, you know, uh, it was off the table that uh, Maduro could be part of new elections, etc. We saw Elliot Abrams say that even, even admit that the fear was that Maduro could win the, the election, so he couldn't be part of them. So we, we saw that, right? But right now with this transitional new proposal, which there are like basically saying that Maduro could participate in the elections. Uh, can you see this, like, how can you inter interpret this? I mean, how do you, um, is it because it's not uh, too much as a, a pressure to have um, Florida? Uh, what's, what's your, what's your, I think I think it's just a I mean I think it's just an issue they don't know how to just how to explain how to justify and they just let it go. So I mean basically what what they're they're not really uh, I mean yes you know the Abrams has said well you know technically he could run, but then you know you see Pompeo saying you know Maduro will never be president again you know kind of thing. So you know they they really have no interest in in that happening. Uh, and and I think you know this is part of the the you know the mixed messages part of a little bit of the mess uh, between uh, U.S. Uh, agencies uh, you know the, the not not getting the whole story together uh, you know even within the same department um, I am convinced that they don't want that there's no room in their plans for President Maduro to run and and to try to be. Uh, 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 president again within that framework. I mean, they, they said very clearly that they want him out. And again, and it's easy to understand because they, 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 they feel in, in their in their reading of Venezuelan reality, they feel that by taking him away, you, you know, dismantle uh, uh, the unity Chavismo. And they want to they want to see that you know they want to do the same way that uh, they, they they saw it done in other places in uh, in um, in Latin America before. I think you know, um, but this is this is a this is a farce. I mean, and I think we should waste time uh, uh, thinking that there's anything going to come out of, of that transition plan. I think that uh, that that's what we need to do is call it out for what it is. You know, it, it's a, it's a it's an anti-Maduro, it's a it's a capitulation uh, sort of plan. And then when you and then you have to add it up to the other policies, and you you know see the bigger picture. You have an indictment against him. You have a military operation against him. You have this, you know, this transition where he needs to go. This is the destruction of Chavismo. And if you have any doubts about this, if you have any doubts, just look at the contract that was signed between Juan Guaido and the mercenaries that tried to uh, invade Venezuela, where there's, you know, there are clauses and there, you know, there, there, there's, uh, um, there's room within that 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 contract for the persecution of of Chavismo, of President Maduro, and other high officials. I mean, the idea here uh, um, uh, was was basically to reenact, uh, you know, the Jakarta method, you know, and, and come out and, and destroy all the what's what's uh, left in, in in Venezuela. But no, so I there's there's a new person in the picture. Apparently, somebody that has ties with the 
with the Venezuelan government or something like they're trying uh, the media or uh, the State Department, they're trying to tie the a relation between uh, this silver cop uh, guy with the Venezuelan government. Do you know, uh, can you explain a little bit more about this? Because uh, one, of, you know, one of these crazy ideas was uh, they, they, they're trying to, in a way to try to you know, get rid of uh, uh, Guaido's uh, participation or his fault, or so, you know, trying to cover him up, basically the operation. You know, they they're coming up with these things like, oh, you know, uh, uh, the Osdal knew about the operation, so you know they they've infiltrated it, or or you know now they're trying, you know, some some obscure businessman and say who who by the way is not, you know, was not a a, a, a chavista, was not pro Maduro, was actually. He, he has a history, he's been investigated before for precisely anti-government uh, uh, actions, you know, like uh, uh, subversive uh, uh, actions. Um, so, but this, and then they're trying to find some time to confuse people and, 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 and especially to confuse international community. What they needed to do is, is uh, you know, somehow um, Convince the international community that Guaido had nothing to do with this, that this was actually a, a plot, you know, by Maduro himself, and you know, because they need, you know, they they made them, they made these people, you know, support a, a man who, you know, in a year has 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 no resource, his popularity has, you know, gone down even further. He has no leadership, and actually is driving, and and, and actually the only thing he he's able to achieve. Is the most number of scandals of you know corruption scandals without being in government, you know he must that must be a record that that, that, that he has. So so you know so they're trying to somehow you know uh, wash his face and 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 you know and 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 show that it is and blame somehow blame this back to to Maduro. But this, but but you know I, again this is not a this is not going to work. I think the Venezuelan people know uh, understand what's what's going on, and I think a lot of people outside as well, despite the you know the loads of of um, uh, misinformation. I think people can understand um, because they've seen this in history before. Then you know what what, what they're after is control of, of Venezuelan resources, and they know who's on what side. So, uh, Carlos, I wanted to ask you another question about uh, the situation of the pandemic in Venezuela. Recently, there was a, a report. Uh, about uh, it says the says Venezuelan official data is absurd, uh, referring to the number of cases and death in Venezuela. It's a report by Human Rights Watch and John Hopkins. What can you say about this? Well, first of all, Human Rights Watch has, has always had an agenda against Venezuela. So I mean, I I, I off the top, I. I have serious doubts about anything that's written by them. You know, they, there's a revolving door between Human Rights Watch and the State Department, and, and a lot of people that have, uh, you know, have have worked there have have been part of the policy against Venezuela for many years. And and you know, on the one side, they 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 you know uh, try to portray Venezuela as a, uh, as a human rights violator, but on the other side, when there are uh, real uh, rights violated by opposition uh, uh, groups and all these things, you know, they 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 are blind to that. So I, I I don't trust uh, off the top you know what, what they say, but then but but you know you don't have to take my word for it. Uh, and then there's a very simple thing you know uh, I, they if we had a crisis if we had a real COVID nineteen crisis the size of the one in Peru Ecuador um, Brazil there's no way you can hide it because you know it, it's not something you could you could. Uh, cover up because you have a lot of people, you'll have a lot of people dying, a lot of people getting uh, sick and, and, and there's, a, 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 there's definitely a strain on the health system that, that is visible. So, you know, you, you wouldn't be able to, 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 to hide this if it was otherwise. But I think, I think that brings us to something else though. Um, why is it so hard for people to understand that you know, after years of saying or, or or listening to the fact that you know the or to the narrative, to reports that Venezuela's health system is completely collapsed, how is it that Venezuela is coping so well with, with COVID nineteen? Some of the people don't understand. Well, that's because what we've been seeing in the first place 
is that yes, we've had problems in our health system, but it never came to a collapse. And it's one of the things that we've, you know, we've defended for, for many years, you know, they, they were portraying this as a completely lost, you know, as a completely lost kind of uh, uh, healthcare system. And we said, no, you know, like we were saying, you know, that's not true. You, this, this is being exaggerated. This is taken out of context. So, but, but the people that have read all these reports from Human Rights Watch and from other people that have for all these years, you know, in their heads, this is a system that, 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 that was destroyed. Actually, we have a very strong system that we, you know, that we built thanks to the Cubans, uh, you know, with the cooperation with Cuba, that we were able to, bring, uh, you know, build the local, um, uh, the local uh, uh, community doctors uh, for preventive medicine, and we have a, a strong infrastructure of, 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 you know, centers that people can go to at least for for the beginning of, of treatments or for preventive medicine. So you know, this, this is important, this is something, uh, you know, this, the system has been struggling against the sanctions, against all these limitations, against, you know, the, the, the violence that, you know, during, the, during the, the protests in 2014 and 2017, where a lot of these places were attacked, but it's been resisting and it's still there. And, and you know, and it gets the, it gets the attention of, of the government. That's why it hasn't, it hasn't really collapsed. Is this myth that you that took the measures and that you took the measures like really uh, early and the like you of had course. the experience of another countries and you took the the effective measures right? Of course, you have a combination. I mean, you have a system that didn't didn't completely collapse the way it was being portrayed, despite all the suffering that has undergone. And then you have measures that were taking consciousness that you know of what was coming of what was coming. We saw what happened in China, and then we saw what happened in Europe. And then we saw, and then we started, you know, thinking, well, how do we prevent this from coming? And so, and we started taking the first measures. The quarantine was established in Michigan before we detected our first case. So these are, and and now, and there's tracing, and there's isolate. I mean, the the, the, the last we we've seen a spike in the last couple of days of numbers, but those numbers are coming from people that are returning to Minnesota. Venezuela is probably the only country in the world right now where people are returning to the country in order to you know to be safe from COVID-19 and you know and, and we've had thousands of people in you know in, in 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 throughout you know South America trying to come back and we've been able to receive some of them and 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 a lot of people have you know have come back have been you know uh, have have the, the disease or carriers so what we we you know we're we're doing quarantines and we're doing the treatment and we're treating them here you know once they they arrive back home but and, and and it's under control. But you know the number of of of, of you know national uh, 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 contagion is is very low. So we're working on that. Uh, and I and, and again, you know, it's 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 one of the few countries that has seen this uh, this uh, influx of people wanting to be here uh, to deal with the, with the um, to, you know to to get better here. Hello. Yeah, this is our quarantine. Uh, <laughs> okay, so we're almost done here, but I just wanted to ask you a last question right now. So uh, it's about the dialogue. We know that right now there is a national uh, table for national dialogue in Venezuela that uh, has two oppositions. Um, so it's the opposition, a moderate opposition, whereas Claudio Fermin, which is like the more, most famous person in Venezuela, and there is the other opposition, which is the radical opposition, the one that is, uh, Guaido is the leader of this opposition, and where they're not, there's not really an interest in, in negotiating anything else than Maduro getting out of uh, office, right? Like a change of government. So why if this, opposition, a uh, moderate opposition, is the ma majority of Venezuelans. It's in the, I mean, we can see the poll like uh, that the majority of Venezuelans do want uh, uh, a negotiation, do want a, a peaceful uh, dialogue, and they want to resolve things like this. They don't want uh, sanctions, they are not, uh, they don't want an invasion. So why are, why are you doing these negotiations with that radical opposition? Why are they on the table? Well, you know, uh, see, see the thing, they are definitely a part of society to, to begin with, obviously. And, uh, 
and you know and they they were part of a um, you know the group that was selected to the national assembly and they became um, you know the, the, there was a rotation of, of different parties until you know they the, this this was the time that they you know the, it corresponded for them to to have the leadership and then when that's when the uh, or the strongest uh, uh, disruptive type of uh, engagement began, you know, when, when they started being very extreme and, and in closing down uh, to dialogue. We, we're trying to, you know, we're trying to dialogue with every sector of society because that, that's our responsibility as a government. That's, just, that's President Maduro, you know, he, he as president has to dialogue with all sectors of society. The problem is that, that this particular sector is the one that is most influenced by the United States and is the one that, that is not, has not been allowed um, to to sit down at the table and to come to some agreement, and it's not, it's because they're not independent. It's because they depend on you know the 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 criteria and you know the influence and you know all, all the support they get from the United States, and they're the ones disrupting the the process. That's why we say that you know if if the United States you know and they, they offered a plan you know uh, a few weeks ago you know. In the, between an, between an indictment and offering you know fifteen million dollars for President Maduro's head and then and offering a military operation that they said to have you know conciliatory, conciliatory plan for transition where again you know it was the same thing Maduro out you know because and and politically you can understand this because politically they 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 see that Maduro is a figure that you know that uh, whose leadership uh, uh, unites uh, Chavismo as a political force so of course they're after him. Of course, you know, because they they want to break down the leadership so that they could you know they they could find ways of of of, of pulling the movement um, uh, apart. But the, but that's 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 something that you see when you're looking from in, from outside, but not from from inside. And and you know when you, you don't see that when when the attacks are stronger, you know people rally up together and to defend the the process because this isn't the project of one man. This is a project of uh, a whole population. We have to di dialogue with them because they're part of society, and we are offering, you know, to dialogue. But it's their position that has been hard, you know, hard line, and it's their position that has been guided by the United States as to not allow uh, dialogue to go on. That's why when we said it's not President Maduro, you know, like they say, who has to step us and step aside and and for Venezuela to move forward, it's the United States that has to step aside. So that we can dialogue, so that they can sit down at the table, they can, you know, they can go to elections, they can get elected again, and if, if they win and so forth, and then we can move forward. So they're, you know, they're the ones being uh, uh, black, and it's the United States that's pushing, them, you know, to, to to block them as a as a negotiating partner. Thank you so much, Carlos, for your time. Uh, it was a pleasure having you here. I wish I had more time to ask more questions. But anyway, so thank well, you. Pay me back and I'll come back and we will do it again. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you all for uh, uh, watching uh, an episode of What the F is Going On in Latin America every Wednesday at noon. Bye. 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 Thank you.